Assalamu alaikum. Welcome back to the Dadhood podcast. And today I have a special guest. We say that every single time because every single father is a special father, alhamdulillah. Uh, but today we have a good friend of mine who's going to be giving us an insight into his life uh, of having a baby on the way and also a child at the moment. How does that work? How, you know, how does a father handle all of that? How does a mother and a family handle all of that? So that's what we're about to get into. Assalamu alaikum, it's Sham. How are you doing? Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullah wa barakatuh. Alhamdulillah, I'm well. How are you? Get the plans and trains out of the way. Alhamdulillah. Yeah, alhamdulillah. Uh, and, and by the way, thank you for all your technical help just now as well. <laughs> no problem, inshallah, alhamdulillah. This is kind of the field. I can't help dip my toes into it, right? <laughs> Uh, alhamdulillah, if we're going to dive straight in, then obviously I have uh, I have a son, Musa, who's one and a half now, um, and we're expecting our second, alhamdulillah. So we're about halfway, uh, the halfway mark uh, at the time of recording this. So yeah, it's tough. <laughs> alhamdulillah, you know, some of the challenges that come with this is that you're trying to manage everything and you have a routine that's already set out, right? And that becomes... Yeah difficult because now everything is you know you're preparing for a complete reset and in your mind constantly the thoughts are of how are we really going to do everything because the first time that we had the child we had no child so you have that prep you have that time you have that flexibility uh um, i was mentioning to my wife you know i i i at your first pregnancy for example if you were to bend over to do something, it would be okay. Now, if you were to look after a child, to put the child in the cot, for example, uh, or the Moses basket, for example, now you've got another child running behind you. So it's just all these crazy factors that we're thinking of, hang on, that this situation will be a lot more different uh, compared to when the first uh, child was here. So we're, we're trying to imagine everything. And it's interesting because there's a lot of mental preparation that we're doing for the baby's arrival because we know that we're going to be past with uh, with quite a bit especially with Musa as well he's, he's very energetic so it's about preparing ourselves and it's a uh, it's an interesting time because we, we don't know what's coming uh, but at the same time it, it's something we're gonna just get ready for basically I'm, I'm sure there's some excitement in there as well bro you don't have to give me a lot oh, of negative straight away come on <laughs> no no it's all excitement it, this is this is just the fun coming out right it's all like okay what are we gonna do how are we gonna do it it is just planning for everything okay then where are we gonna move you know we're gonna start this all this logistical stuff it's uh, some of the best parts you know um <laughs> i know i know look at it in a negative light but honestly it's it's really fun even recently um i had to you you find logistics fun because that's just who you are bro <laughs> i i i'm a logistics man through and through right <laughs> yeah yeah, no, you know, have the lot. Me, me and my wife very similar in, in in a lot of senses, right? And this is one of the things we we plan and we work so efficiently that we end up doing it, and it becomes this little fun bubble and fun task that we do. So, and and, and Musa sees that as well. So he'll run behind us sometimes. Now, alhamdulillah, he's at that stage where he's he's running. So, mashallah, running behind the. So he does that. It's that's. That's very uh, cute. You could say that uh, you and your wife thrive off planning things together and ticking things off a list together. You know, I, I kid you not, we have an app, right? We have an app that is shared between our phones of the task lists in the day, and that's how we both manage our days together. Right, inshallah. That's excellent. Do you know what? I want to go into that, actually. So uh, before we do, let's, let's just pause there because that's something I want to get in. <laughs> okay. Um, I want to I want to just bring back some context into this, which is sure. uh, when how how old were you when you uh, first had Musa? Oh, how old was I? I was twenty nine when I had Musa. Twenty nine, twenty eight, yeah, when I had Musa. So uh, technically, I would say it's quite late. Now that I see it, Allah has a plan for everything. I would say it's quite late. I would have. But why? Why? Why in your head is that late? Why is it late? Yeah. Hey, yeah, why is it late? You know, because I, I'm I'm thinking from the perspective of I would have loved to have children a long time ago, um, and I feel every kind of human being, let alone a parent, would want to have a lifelong with their children in a certain type of way, and I felt I've always wanted to have 
uh, you know, a bond with my children, you know, to be able to be physically at a certain ability with my children as they are growing up as well. I don't want to be one of those old parents that had a really, really young child. You know, you see that in our community sometimes. It, the, the parents are like 60, 70, even 80, and then their child is just reaching teenage years. And there's a yeah. huge gap. And, and there's no such kind of uh, attachment in a very physical way, no sports together. You know, you can't run around with each other and play together. So I really don't want that uh, kind of dynamic within the house. Uh, and at the same time, I think, the, the joy of being a parent, I think you, you can't explain it and no one can fathom it until you go through it, right? So it's something that I wish I had attained earlier in, in, in life as well. So generally, I think that that's kind of the two, two-tiered reason why I would I would have loved to have children much earlier. Okay, alhamdulillah. Uh, but I think, you know, even, even still, the uh, age that you've had them at is still relatively young in comparison to many many people and I, I feel like yeah. you know even even by the time you know you're 40 and Musa is like 10 roughly uh you can still beat him in a race bro so you'll be okay yeah. don't worry <laughs> yeah I'll be okay I'll be okay absolutely and that, that's that's really why I think alhamdulillah it's still it's still a great time you know it's not it's not late at all um it, it I just would have preferred it a lot earlier I think it would have been great especially because then you you obviously have one child, right? And you're planning for many more, inshallah, uh, with the permission of. So because of that, it's like, imagine it on the last child. You know, that's really what you want to... Yeah, no, they, that's true, that's true. That makes sense. Right? You're, you're much of a visionary. you got, you got the visions. Right? Thinking ahead, alhamdulillah. Yes. So in terms of new baby coming, mm -hmm. um, uh, was this something that, you know, was like, okay, we want to make sure there's a small gap between our children. So you, you guys were, as a couple, like actively being like, let's try and get as many children as possible within a small gap. Or did you, uh, you know, it was sort of not intentional, it was just, you know, whenever, you know, Allah plans for children to come, the children will come and khalas will move like that. What, what was the thinking behind it? Sorry, I'm just going to sneeze one second. <laughs> Cut this out, sorry. It, it, did, it, it didn't even come. Uh, I was waiting for you to finish your question. But yeah, um, so... In relation to that, when, when me and my wife, we got married, we knew that, okay, obviously family planning has to come into the picture because now we're married. Uh, but I I kind of was, my whole vision with marriage is at first, because you've never really had any kind of relationship before marriage, what you need to do is you need to have a time span where you are together. Like halal dating, but you're married, halas, right? You're, you're kind of enjoying the world, you're traveling, you're eating out, you're you're getting to know each other and your bonding. So there's that duration of period where we, we were like, no, we have to block out this time. This is our time to grow and cultivate each other, grow and learn, and, and then we can bring children into the, into the world. And then I saw that, 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 that time period we had. And then, uh, you know, we had Musa. And then from there, we were like, okay, we need to be, we need to be ready about this, right? We need to have children in succession with a specific amount of period so that, this doesn't get very uh, tiresome. This doesn't get very long. We know people within, you know, friend circles that have had children like 10 years apart, 20 years apart. And it, it becomes very difficult once you're at that certain stage of life to, you know, kind of have a great reset in that sense as well. Um, routine changes, how you do things change, you know, kind of try to remember just from the last pregnancy to this one, we're trying to remember so many things. We're like, what did we do then? You know, just trying to recall that. So I can't imagine once your children are like, you know, 10, 11, and you're doing something completely different with them, and you've got used to such a completely different life, that how are you going to be coming back to such basics and, and sleepless nights, and how are you going to be adapting to that again? Um, so generally, we said, you know, there's going to be a short amount of gap between them. Um, and, and even through the pregnancy, to be honest, this is still something that's fluid. We talk about it like almost every couple of weeks, again, you know, just to make sure how we're doing it, how she's feeling. Um, because you can plan a certain way, but then you might feel a certain way as well. And it's important to obviously have those open channels and open conversations together. Um, because really it's not me going through it at the same time, right? It's, it's also my wife. She's the only one that's going through it, bruv. <laughs> yeah, she is, you know, credit to her. I love this, our wives, you know, they, they, they really go through a lot. And it's something 
that we as men really don't feel um as much as we may empathize uh we really don't feel their pain we really don't feel their struggle and each pregnancy is very very different as well so i i remember that pregnancy with musa and you know new baby um it's it's completely different so again it comes with its own challenge you know Maybe. Yeah, they, they they usually say that, right, is, um, you know, the second baby is usually a completely different pregnancy. And yeah. some say that actually the second baby is supposed to be easy. I don't think that applies to everyone's situation, to be honest. Uh, I think for our situation, for my wife, it was easier the second time around um, for, for the whole. I mean, it might just be more of a mindset thing that I've gone through it once. I can go through it again and yeah. have a bit more strength. Um, but also, I, I feel like also in terms of the birth procedure and stuff, uh, your body has adapted from the previous one. So it's a lot easier to to uh, birth the child as well. Absolutely. My wife was talking about this and she was she was doing some research and she was watching some videos on YouTube. And she said, you know, the first time people give a normal birth in the hospital, but then the second time and third time people are giving home births, right? And she was like, because your body gets used to it, you're a bit more confident, you know how it's gone. Um, so just generally, physically, right, you're able to do a lot more because of that effect. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. I just, you, you mentioned something, which is, you know, you decided as a couple that it would be best for us to spend a couple of years just with each other before we bring children in. So yeah. tell me a bit about that. What was the the thinking behind that was what's the mindset behind that and what benefits did you find because there's going to be a lot of you know despite this podcast being for fathers there's a, there's a lot of brothers that watch this yeah. preparation for fatherhood as well uh so they might be married now they don't have children and they might be in that boat thinking do i want to do it now or do i want to enjoy my time with my wife a little bit more so right what, what, what was your perspective on this absolutely i think if you want to be a good father you have to be a good husband right um, the reason I say that is because your children are going to see who you are as a man, how you're vulnerable, how you're authoritative, how you're a leader, all because of just your relationship with your wife. That's the first and foremost thing that they're going to see. Before that, oh, okay, dad, dad tells me yes, dad tells me no. They're going to see how you behave as an individual aside from being their parent, right? Um, so that's number one. If, if you want to be a good father, you have to manage your other relationships because they're going to be seen and your children are going to see them as well. So the thinking behind it is, again, two-tiered. It's number one that in our culture, uh, you know, once you get married and unfortunately divorce rates are very high in our community. Once you get married, you pop a kid and if you're not getting along, there's no compatibility. Now you've got a kid stuck in the equation. You're either going to try drag this out or now that you've brought a kid in, it's called complications and there's going to be a single parent household, right? I want to avoid that completely, right? Mm. It, not that you go into a marriage thinking that's the likely scenario, of course not. But you don't want to then also be in a more difficult predicament, uh, right? The other thing is that, hang on, this is beautiful, this is marriage, this, this is so much to do. I've been looking for a partner for, you know, however long, um... And, and now is our chance to enjoy together, do things together. You know, all the things you see on the movie, the TV shows, you know, go out here, go out there, go to this restaurant, you know, just enjoy walks in the park uh, and kind of just hey, do now, things Now together. it's not TV shows, it's okay, it's Instagram reels yeah. and TikToks, okay? That's yeah, you know. They're getting their expectations or relationships now. Yeah, unfortunately. And I mentioned something like a walk in the park, but, you know, who knows? <laughs> And the Eiffel Tower, that's the only way, you know, unless it doesn't have a thousand likes, you know, this is not the way our marriage. <laughs> right. So it's unfortunate, but really and truly, that's what it's about. It's about having this um, kind of time together in a obviously completely halal, pleasing to Allah's a scenario uh, where you're both rewarded for getting to know one another, you know, ironing out any issues, coming up with kind of plans of the future together coming up with maybe uh, you know just things you want to do things you want to achieve maybe say milestones together and this is not like a, a a meeting this happens very naturally this happens very beautifully in a very fun way um you've really got to be best friends together uh, and i think that's how when you have such a time period to become friends when you enter parenthood together it's such a more beautiful scenario. It's something that becomes so much more um, 
pleasing to you, so much more uh, enjoyable. You're, you're able to self-sacrifice for each other because this is now someone who you respect totally, someone who you love, someone who you're, uh, you know, selfless for. So I think it, it, that time here is so important because it really cultivates a lot of this stuff. And ideally, you want to do a lot of the stuff on your bucket list before children because when children come, I was saying this to my wife, the types of holidays we were able to do before, we're not able to do now, right? I could take you hiking and I could take you skydiving and I could take you wherever before the kids. I can't take you there after the kids, right? Now we have to have baby holidays or baby proof holidays, right? And and it starts even in pregnancy, right? Um, we were we were in Egypt and or I, we wanted to go hiking, but my wife was expecting that time with Musa, right? And she physically wouldn't be able to hike. It was like, okay, we can't do this anymore. You know, so there's certain things you filter out and you have to be aware of those things. And I think what happens, unfortunately, is that we as brothers don't inform other brothers of the good stuff and preparation stuff. And I think I, I focus a lot more on how to do things with people. Whenever I'm giving some sort of advice, this, this is how I would do something. I'm not imposing that advice, but this is just a how because people find it very difficult to figure out how. There's enough questions, you know, fifty debates and repeated debates and stuff. But unfortunately, what people really want to know is how do I do something? You know, whether it be in religion, whether it be in parenting, how do I tackle this issue? How do I do something? So how is always very Give, give give me an example of an issue which is usually put forward as, you know, very theoretically, this is the idea and what should be done. And contrast that with what you would say in terms of how to practically carry it out and do it. Put you on the spot here. But yeah. That, take that, it high. Yeah, that's the thinker one. Um, it, it's very difficult, right? Um, you don't know a scenario. Um Let's say, let's say, for example, theoretically, yeah. okay, people say you should make sure that uh, you give your spouse enough attention throughout the week, okay? Uh, you give her enough time, and that's how your marriage is going to thrive. You know, people people say that. If you give enough time to your spouse, then inshallah, your marriage will thrive. How would you say that? Okay, actually, you, know, you guys need something practical here, and this is how you... So my advice would be uh, uh, my own lived experience, which would be you're not trying to slot in time. You're living life with your, your partner. You're living life with your partner. You're living life with your wife. You don't need to give her time and attention. It should be there. You should want her attention and you should be so present that it's it's almost there. Like you turn to her as your pillar. You turn to her for advice. You turn her to... You know, say, I was thinking about this. So why do monkeys jump so high? Like you should be able to freely express your things with her. You know, it's not about that you just give her time and listen to her. Like you even just speaking to her is also giving her that attention and the value. Um, and in turn, you do the same. If you're having to slot in these things, unfortunately, what it becomes is, is it's a tick list and you're not really present and more than ticking the box of yeah you've given her attention by listening to her for 15 minutes off your you know google calendar it's not going to be something that's so um beneficial to your marriage because it, it it's a to-do list whereas it should really come from an internal place of you wanting to speak to your wife of you wanting to hear how her day was out of genuine concern and interest in what she did how she did it why she did it you know what she felt about it and just having that kind of dialogue and culture. I think one of the most practical ways I do this is I'm terrible with my phone and my replies now, right? Is I made sure that I, I get rid of it. <laughs> it's always on the side. And one of the things that unfortunately I see is people just talking to each other with their head down and they're not attentive. They're not, they're not there. And one of the most practical examples we have in the hadith and the setup is when someone would pass. If, if someone was here, he would be like, yeah, yeah, yeah twisting his head he's shifting his whole body right this is how we live the sunnah a lot of people talk about hadith and how the characteristics of the process that it was but if we're not 
living the sunnah, yeah, well done, you fast Mondays and Thursdays, but you're treating your wife like this. You're missing the hadith where he says the best of you are those who are the best of their wives, right? <laughs> Again, it starts here in a, in a way to cult behavior uh, towards your spouse. And I think that's really what sets you up with everything else. Because if that's not right, remember your children will get married and they'll have their own families and they'll go away from your family house to their houses, you know, boys and girls. And then you're left back with your wife. And if you haven't called relationship at the beginning, at the start, what you're going to kind of have at the end is not going to be that, you know, couple gray haired, holding hands, walking on their crutches together, right? It, it, it's not going to be that. It's going to be just something very sad and lonely, unfortunately. And people don't realize how long that the, the long vision is that my partner's my partner with me for life. I will reach an end goal with my partner. And my partner's not just an end goal for me in this life. It's my partner's end goal for me in the next. You know, I, I want to be in gender with my partner. And there we're going to fly through constellations together, you know, drinking loads of wine together. That's it, right? But it it's this it's this kind of disconnect with that my partner is my everything, my wife and my spouse are my everything, and they're really who I need to invest my thing into, my time, my value, my resources, my my heart and soul, and with that that you'll see the return just come very naturally. You mentioned you know ensuring that you're present with your spouse instead of just treating it as like a time block, something that's on a to-do list. Like now I'm going to go spend time with my wife. Now yeah. somebody who is very logistical and has a planning and organizing mindset like yourself, how do you take yourself out of that mindset and make sure that you're present with your spouse? Um, so it, it's it's very interesting, right? Every, alhamdulillah, since Musa was born, one of the, one of the kind of risk, as we know, that children bring was he brought the flexibility of working for me, right? I I left my job. I had a bit more flexibility in how I was able to work. So that was the risk he brought. I, I didn't turn into a millionaire or something like that, but that was, for me, phenomenal. I got to spend every single day with him at home, you know, um, at least more. And I think that was one of the, the most biggest blessings I, I could ever have imagined him to bring with him. Because uh, I really wanted to be there. I know we we don't get any paternity leave, right? It's a side point. Mm -hmm. And then other countries get like six months of like uh, paternity leave. I'm not talking about maternity leave. I'm talking about the father's gay sometimes. Yeah. And they don't care about us, bro. They don't. Yeah. yeah, but you need you need the father there, right? It's so important. But so I was so sad. I'm really going to miss him. I'm not going to see him. And by the time I get home at seven o'clock and then, you know, it's going to be bedtime and I spend it with quality. So one of the things he, he brought with him, alhamdulillah, uh, is for me to be flexible so that I could, I could be present. Now, what happens here, is I simply manage my whole day around the family. Meaning if early in the morning, like now, I can pencil in some time. I've got some tasks to do. In the middle of the day when he's having a nap, I've got some tasks to do. In the mm. evening, I've got some tasks to do. I will block all of the tasks. And then all we will do is that we'll have meal together. We'll have breakfast together. You know, I'll help around the house kind of thing. And then we'll do something else together. And then it's, it's actually all facilitated the other way for me in making sure that family kind of logistically is working more because everything. Everything else task wise will come, you know, even my wife sometimes says, no, 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 I've got this part. You go, I know you've got that to do, you know, you, you go ahead and you do that. You know, if you need some extra time, let me know. Da, da, da. And do you see how working together and, and prioritizing you only be able to flourish because then it, there's a support system is there, you know, they're not feeling you can't do your work. You're always working. It's like, no, no, I, I understand you're helping out. You've always helped out. You're, you're present with us, you know. I'm going to support you and leverage on you as well. Not that that's the reason why you do it, but it's just a natural progression of how the relationship becomes. So I think that's a very important thing and that's how it works for me. And, and to be very honest, it, it kind of just flows like that. Okay. So, so let's get into that. Cause that's something you, you mentioned earlier and I said, let's, let's, let's look at this, which is the practical way in which you and your wife organize your time. So you said you've got this yeah. app and it has to-do lists on it. 
and you sort of organize your schedule. I think this is really important to get into, you know, as as the theme of like what we're talking about, which is practicality within a marriage and practicality as a mother and a father. Yeah. I think this is very important because people, I've been speaking to a lot of brothers very recently, in fact, um, you know, maybe in the past week, I've probably spoken to like four brothers who have had the same issue, okay, mm-hmm. which is I was really ambitious, you know, prior to getting married or maybe even just prior to having kids. So I'm married, but I haven't got kids yet. Very ambitious at that stage. Yeah, let's take the practical uh, sort of stereotypical example. I'm, I'm at uni, I'm involved in my ISOC, okay, yeah. I'm volunteering, I'm, I'm uh, you know, I'm, I'm working part time, I've got my degree going, I'm trying to hit the gym, like all that kind of stuff. And then I get married and okay, now I'm like a little bit away from my community. I'm not doing so much stuff in the masjid. You know, and you you're kind of there, but I'm still, you know, I'm 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 at an okay level. Maybe I'm just got a little bit of extra priorities now. I'm focused on my wife, my relationship, my finances, and my career. Then kids come into the picture, and it's like, okay, now my uh, mind has shifted towards my children and, and my family life, and I've totally forgotten about my ambitious goals that I used to have. I used to volunteer in the community. I used to do khutbas. I used to memorize a lot of Quran. I used to go to the gym, and now those things, even though I'd love to have them. Ah, it's kind of like I just have to give more time to my family now, so I can't really do that. So these like four or five brothers that I'm speaking to very recently, I'm seeing this same pattern. I think it's, I think this is a very common pattern amongst lots of brothers, where you know it, you you're so ambitious at some point, and you just get to a stage where you're like comfort zone can't go back to those goals anymore. But it seems like for yourself, um, you have created some sort of systems to be able to still get things done around your family life and in your own personal life and it looks like that's done intentionally with your spouse so let's get a little bit into that so we can uh, break it down a little bit and maybe these brothers who as we've been speaking to they might be listening to this they can see get that advice from yourself as well absolutely so well, i i would say two things one was a lesson i learned from another brother right and he he we were just discussing about parenthood and everything and he gave me an anecdote of how he really misses the the really baby stage of children and it really stuck with me and it really resonated and I'll, I'll tell you why it kind of follows on to this point and he was like you know when they were babies and I didn't have to talk to them and read them bedtime stories before this, I used to just shh, and they'd fall asleep after like 20 minutes he goes I really missed that stage why because I used to be able to do a lot of earth guard in that stage it was just me dark room and I could remember a lot and I was like, this is mind-blowingly profound, right? And I was like, you've hit the nail on the head in realizing, and I think people don't realize this, right? Unfortunately, we don't get, and this is, again, the problem of how, this is a problem of why people don't get taught how, is we don't get taught that you are a constant worshiper of Allah, a constant worshiper, right? Right? You are always a slave of Allah, but that slave is a servant who's a constant worshiper. And you will navigate through different stages in life, whether single, whether married, whether a parent, uh, you know, whether a grandparent, and you're going to constantly be riding this wave of the life. And you're going to approach different stages with different responsibilities and different time constraints. Now, how do you factor in worshiping Allah in this? You need to be able to do it. Maybe not at the same level as a uni person who's completely free, misses half the lectures to just be part of the ISOC, right? Because that's completely different now that you're a parent or now that you're in full-time work. How do you do it? Are you making use of your train journeys? Are you making use of the time that you have quiet in, in break time? Are you are you making sure that, you know, when the kids, you're putting them to sleep, you're making a card? I think what happens is that we think that there was this once upon golden time. And we do this with our history. There's this golden era of Islam. We were great. We ruled the world. But now I'm sitting here on my sofa, not doing anything for the deen or for the community. It's kind of looking back, wishing upon something, but not being able to do something in even a small, small effort. It's, it's not making any effort at all to be able to do something uh, for yourself, right? And this is the problem. Why? Because you... You can never get back to that. You're always wishing for that. And you're not thinking, hang on, I'm in a new position. I've got this new new attire on and I have to behave in this new attire. How do I behave as a worshiper in this new attire? Right? If I'm wearing, you know, 
a tracksuit one day. I have to behave like a person who wears tracksuit. Okay, I'll go jogging. No problem. You know, I'm in a suit. Okay, no problem. You know what? I'm in a suit right now. I need to behave like I'm in a suit. So I, I kind of struck my stuff. It's about realizing that, hang on, when I'm in university, I've got, I got X amount of time. I can do everything. No problem. Now I'm a parent. Now I'm a husband. My way of worshiping about Allah changes. I'm taking my family out to eat. It's worship. I'm feeding them myself with my hand is worship. I'm making sure that their needs are taken care of is worship. Even if I'm working, it's worship. As long as I'm saying throughout the day, Allah, I'm doing this for you. And, and Allah, you know, I want to do a lot of stuff. And I know you're going to facilitate it to me. But right now I'm doing this for you. Halas. You know, Allah, you know, I'm worried about finances, but I'm spending this on them because you know that I'm doing it for you. And this is my sadaqah. You know, I used to give loads of sadaqah back in the day to people abroad, people here, people there, you know, hundreds of pounds. I used to charity fundraise, but you know what, Allah, now working for them all day and I'm giving this money on my family because that is my, their first right as well. And then I'm spending extra because I need to make sure that they're happy. You know, you've given me these favors. I'm thankful for those favors. And I'm giving it back to my family because they deserve it. And I'm thanking you and I'm and I'm showing everyone that I spend on my family because these are the blessings that Allah has given me. And you tell me to, you know, kind of show that. So people don't realize that you have to behave in that way to worship Allah in that new situation that you land in. And this is a, a, a that problem with the how that he he as my as as I said, my friend, he hit a nail on the head when he said, When they are going to sleep, I do have cut. And I was like, that's amazing. And I, and I started planning it in my head. I said, you know what? Come come next baby, right? This was ages ago. But I said, come next baby. I'm going to do that. And, and I figured out a way. And then I tweaked it. And then kind of adapted it to myself. And then in that of card, right? It's amazing because then Musa now has a little kind of recognition of stuff. Uh, and, and it's amazing because he now has that kind of uh, attachment to that as well. And it's what I... So it kind of only benefits you, your family, everything. But you have to know how things change over time. But you need to evolve over time. You can't just wish for you being single. Everyone would wish for that. But that's not life. You have to behave as a new person as you're progressing through life. And as you get better, you should be getting better. But just because you're not doing the same thing doesn't mean you're not getting better. This is another key point that people think that just because they're not doing the same things, they're not getting better. No, 100% you're getting better. You're actually spending way more than you ever did in Sadaqah because you're spending every day on your family to clothe them, to the house, pay the bills. You don't think all of this is charity? Of course. So I think it takes away people's mindset. And unfortunately, we associate only those things that we did back in university, being in the ISO, being in the masjid, mm. to that's the only way we can do it. That's the only way. Because that's the only way they know. How else do you do it? How else is so profound that every day you can be like, Alhamdulillah, I'm content. You know what? I'm going to work today. It's for my family. But this is a big worship. Eight hours. I didn't even used to do this in, you know, uni days. I used to be prayed like two extra. That was it. Eight hours of like jihad that I'm doing for my family. I don't even want to be here right now. I want to be with them, you know, but I need to work so I can provide for them. So it becomes this kind of mindset that it gets you through. You understand that this is your new worship and that in itself uh, is number one. Number two, I know this is a long answer, but number two would be you involve them in everything. You know, alhamdulillah, I, I do khutbahs at my local masjid. You know, I, as you know, I've organized some uh, recent Islamic uh, events and stuff. Family is always there with me. You know, Musa and my wife are not far behind. Um, and this is, this is something that will cultivate that family life, grow it, but then also involve everyone then you don't need to balance the two out. There is no balancing the two out. It's just all one cohesive cog, right? My family's with me. I'm doing this, you know? Okay. And then when my wife wants to do something, I'm right behind, you know? And it's just about flowing with each other in the things that you want to do. And you realize how quickly um, things happen and how productive you can be. Um, and, and it just, again, it flows. What are some of the... Uh practical steps that you take with your spouse to create that uh, I think that that to-do list that shared to-do list I think is is one of the biggest things that we take uh, together um, when making any kind of plans when kind of looking into our diary even day-to-day -day stuff literally changing the vinces on there right <laughs> um, 
shopping is shopping is on there. When we need to make a menu is on there for the week kind of thing. We make a menu of what we're cooking for the week because every day going, what should we cook today? is just something that I don't want to do, right? So we, we spend five minutes, we make a menu for the week. And boom, there we have it. We know what we're eating for the week. Um, and uh, I think that shared to-do list is beautiful because then if I'm ever saying, yeah, yeah, I'll do this plan, I'm never double booked. I know exactly when I'm available. What we're doing that day, what kind of time constraints I got, and I know all of the tasks in the day that I've got to do anyway. So I know my availability, how the day is going to be like, how what we're doing and what and when. Um, so again, it's it's very fluid, very flexible. And by looking at that, sometimes I look at it and it just reminds me. Hang on, it's not just me and my plan. I think people become very uh, selfish. I look at that and and it's like, okay, this is my family's time and my time, and. Can I give this time to this person as well? Right? It makes you know, okay, yeah, yeah, ten hours in the gym, five hours with the brothers every day, <laughs> making sure you're home at three a.m. in the morning. This is not good family behavior, and I think we we forgot to instill that decency after marriage as well in, into brothers. Unfortunately, brothers expect brothers to be meeting up every week, staying a, a week to late, you know, and leaving their family at home. It's not the way to behave. It's not the way to behave. So. It's about shifting that mindset from being single to being a good family man, which will then make you a great father, right? And I think shift is what's so important. They see that, hang on, my father is always home on time. There's a cap. He's not out late. He's not getting lost with his brothers and stuff. Yes, there's brotherhood. He's always with his brothers. You know, there's a good community around him, but he's not getting lost there. He knows that he comes home at a certain time. He's there to protect us in the evenings. You know, he's, he's kind of always with our, our mother, you know, and they have a good relationship and they're together and they go sleep together and they wake up together. And this is a big thing. And it may be a subtle thing as well, but remember that children pick up on all sorts. If they're seeing that their parents have kind of disconnect, they're, they're the first people that are going to be picking up on it. They're the first people that are going to be picking up on it. I think um, a lot of times we do a disservice to the brothers who, who are getting married and get into marriage by telling them uh, only this line, which is you're a leader of your family, mm -hmm. without telling them what that really means. Absolutely. Because if you tell somebody, okay, you're a leader, now that person, depending on their mindset and their experience, is going to interpret what it means to be a leader. And if this person thinks that a leader means that, well, I'm just the head and what I say goes, yeah. uh, then they'll behave in that way in their marriage. And they will do these things of staying out at 3 a.m. and and becoming selfish and things like this. They become when tyrants. somebody, they become tyrants, exactly. Yeah. That's that's right. Uh, but if somebody really truly understands what it means to be a leader, uh, they understand that actually it means responsibility. It means service. It means, you know, being with the people and not being over them. And this is exactly what you see from the life of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He was not a tyrant. He was with his people. He was there in the trenches, literally in the trenches. And uh, he was he was taking part in every single aspect of life, just as the rest of his companions were, and and that then translates into his relationship with his wives. I mean, if you look at how his wives described him, and uh, despite having so many wives, I mean, we're here faltering when it comes to just having the responsibility over one wife, and we're not spending enough time with our wife and our family. Let alone this man who had the responsibility of giving da'wah to the world training his companions to be da'is and then on top of that spending time with his wives and his children and then on top of that even his grandchildren and then even on top of that just random people in his neighborhood that he was going to visit and serve and things like this you know um he he, he knew that it, it wasn't it wasn't of course there was barak in his time right and that's 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 a different point and that's a very very important point is bringing barak into your time maybe you can discuss that before we finish but aside from Baraka in time, he just understood what it meant to be a leader. You know, he understood that, okay, I have these various responsibilities and I'm going to have the attitude to be able to carry out these responsibilities in in the most, you know, the best way uh, possible. Um, so sometimes we just don't tell brothers it's what it means to be a leader. If we just tell them you are a leader and we leave it to them, it's where a lot of sometimes the issues start coming. Absolutely, and I couldn't agree with you more. And this, this is again goes back to 
people don't realize leader doesn't mean tiring. Leader is someone who's uh, in, in, in like kind of leadership books, you'll, you'll find this term called a servant leader. You know, mm. someone who is a servant leader means he's at the service of others. He's literally their servant in that sense, right? Uh, in in uh, Arabic, would be khadim, and someone who's who does khidm of someone, right? And to serve people like that is very different. When and it's very humbling and it's very honourable, but we we don't get taught the how to do this, right? That, that how to step, take these steps to make sure that you become this leader, right? This this kind of cultivation on this journey, um, and what happens is again, you said they. They, I, they're going to just get loose. That's it. I've now got authority. I'm the man of the house. What I say goes, do this, do that. You know, where's my food? You know, I don't like it. Slam it against the wall. And that's why you have some of these issues, unfortunately. And then there's no cultivation of a decent family man. And I use the word decent in the sense of uh, ethically, right? Morally uh, in how he behaves. Um, so that's a that's a big problem, I think. Like you said, the process alone is is prime example, and we have so many examples. But I feel that in the brothers' circles, these are not conversations that are had, and that's a problem, right? May Allah bless one of my closest friends. And so when I was uh, well, when when he, uh, born, he said, "I need an hour of your time. Yeah, just jump on the phone call with me. I need an hour of your time." I said, "Okay, no problem." So. I called him and he gave me a whole how to do everything. This is how nappy is going to be like. This is how delivery is going to be like. This is what this is going to be like. And I was like, wow, thank you. I needed that. He goes, I did. I went through it. No one told me anything. This is what I discovered. And I know you're, you know, you're going to have a baby soon. So here you go. Right? I was like, thank you so much. And I, I kid you not, it was a lifesaver. Right. And, and these conversations are not had. Okay, maybe you don't need to have them with everyone because some of them may be sensitive topics, but you need to be able to trust a few people that you need to have those conversations with, right? And it's about having those mature conversations. It doesn't need to be well about, it doesn't need to be overly sensitive, it doesn't need to cross certain lines, obviously, because spouses are being talked about. However, it is important to talk about how you behave as a man amongst men and how you are someone who should be at the service of your family. And this service of the family is often forgotten. Right when we look at the example of being a shepherd, we forget the shepherd grazes them, walks around tirelessly making sure they have new grass to eat. Walks around even if it's raining, has to look after his sheep. Forgets that they has to wake up at the dawn of like uh, you know at early in the morning, break of dawn. Yeah, right. So all, all of these things they forget that the the shepherd has to do, which is completely against any kind of comfort zone, right? Any kind of comfort zone, and I think. People think that now that they're in that leadership position, they have comfort. They're at the top. They just answer a few emails. Like it's it's not the corporate world. You're you're in you're in a family structure. It's completely different. You're not sitting at the head seat answering emails. You literally need to be at the service of everyone under you and, and lift them up. You know, and that's the game here. That is literally the game plan. Uh, is that you need to lift everyone under you and you need to pick up every slack that there is. No one else needs to pick that up. You have to take all responsibilities. And and a sheikh said this to me once. He goes, if you as a father are not struggling, are not, are not uh, the one who's constantly having to pick up the slack for everyone, you're, you're not doing your role right. You, yeah. If someone is struggling, you need to be under them, pushing them. If something's happening, if you haven't been that responsibility, you should be tired. You as a man in the family, that should be tired. Not tired of hearing possibly cause them but from the perspective of that you've lifted everyone up you're there pushing everyone that you need to be making so much effort that this is what really is uh, the kind of peak and pinnacle of what you need to be in the house sometimes brothers take this as weakness you know that uh, if I serve my family in this type of way and I I, I make time for my spouse rather than my spouse making time for me, right? And if I go out of my way to think about her needs and all this kind of stuff, that it's a it's a level of weakness from a man. That in fact, 
you know, the man should just get along with the, what the man needs to do and the wife will just sort herself out and she'll work around that because yeah, I need the man is the head of the household and, uh, you know, this is, you know, to do anything other than that is seen, seen as weakness. But um, this concept is coming from a totally different place than what Islam wants from us, right? Mm. Islam wants from us to rid ourselves of our ego. Islam wants, of, wants us to... Uh, to 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 be of to be at service to others. Islam wants us to look at the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and see how he was not weak when he was doing these things, and rather this was a strength of his. Mm. And uh, I think sometimes brothers they they take maybe one aspect of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam's character of maybe strength and courage and and you know brute force when he needed that in particular areas. And yeah. they apply it to other areas that that he never applied it to. In fact, yeah. uh, so this this is uh, led to a lot of confusion in our time, which I don't want to go down that route of the whole masculinity, blah 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 blah, yeah. all that kind of stuff. But but this is this is what we're starting to see creeping into the life of a husband and a wife and a mother and a father. Yeah, and uh, I mean, this is not this is not uh, what what should be happening. Should not be seen as as a weakness. And in fact, this is. The strength of a father and strength of a husband is be able to do these things and to to look after his wife in this type of way. And in fact, you'll find that if you do this, your wife will see you in a in a much more manly light than you thought. Absolutely, you know, absolutely. And it's, it reminds you of that statement of uh, Omar al-Taan, where he said, you know, be like a kitten in the house and a lion outside of the house. Allahu Akbar. And it, it kind of tackles that whole thing of. There you go show any weakness he said be like a kitten in the house and be like a lion outside of the house you uh, rather we have the opposite right we have keep <laughs> our home our home they, they all sorts of oppression all sorts of them they're like for the own in the house right and outside these guys won't say a word to anyone no rajula no manliness, no manliness uh, manliness right absolutely they would never do anything like someone step barges them sorry sorry you know really timid guys and, and at home they're like Fir'aun, you know, I am your Lord above high. So unfortunately, it's, 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 it's the mentality of that person in the first instance is ex extremely wrong, extremely corrupt. And that's what needs to change, right? People need to realize that this is not weakness. This is something that of strength. The process, and for example, is so many examples that literally flooded my mind as you were speaking of him having nicknames with his wives. He used to call uh, Aisha radiallahu and in, in hadith, it's recorded. He used to say, Ya Aish. He used to call Aish. Uh, erasing with her, you know, when, for example, she was angry with him, he would say, you know, when you're angry with me, you say, uh, you know, Rabbu Ibrahim, you know, you say, oh, the Lord of uh, Ibrahim, but not the Lord of Muhammad, you know? So, and, but he would deal with that. Why are you, why are you kind of mentioning other men or, you know, you don't love me and da -da -da, I'm the man, you should be only taking my name and, Oh, there's none of this, right? There's this procedures, how you deal with it, the kindness, the softness, the gentleness. And again, another hadith professor said, again, constantly going back to the sunnah. It's just filled immense lessons that people are not applying, but it's also the problem that we're not taught how to apply them. That the professor said, any house uh, that is um, uh, kind of doesn't have gentleness in it is, is like class finished, right? Um, uh, the hadith but basically like the, there's no point if you don't have gentleness in the house like you're not going to have anything yeah you're not going to have anything that's there for you um, gentleness is what creates that culture in the house you're gentle with your children gentle with your spouse you know you're kind of a gentle man right yeah Eve, like, yeah and unfortunately we have this lad culture and um, that for me is one of the biggest problems to creating a, a good family life. This lab culture, this, um, you know, inappropriate jokes, constantly talk about females, to, you know, social media stuff that they follow. And it, the lab culture is really, really uh, dangerous for a good family life, I think. Yeah, it is. It is, subhanAllah. And people, a lot of brothers walk into a married life with the, the mindset of a lad or the mindset of like, uh, you know, not having that mature mindset ready for a marriage. A lot of them walk in thinking that they can just be how they were before and uh, things would be the same. Uh, but unfortunately, you must wake up and realize that 
when you walk into a marriage, this is the next step of your maturity as a man. You move into the next level, the next phase of your manlyhood. Uh, you can't just carry on being how you were before and expect that to just uh, allow you to flourish in a marriage. Yeah, you're really going to have to uh, check yourself. And to be honest, if you don't, then when you have children, your children are going to check you. And uh, this is even from the moment that they're born, you, you'll feel it. You'll feel the pinch. You'll, you'll look at your, your baby that is a few months old, that is crying in front of you. And you're going to start feeling angry at the fact that this kid won't stop crying. And you're going to realize, where is this anger coming from? Why am I, why, why do I behave like this? Why do I have this mindset towards a little baby? And that, that's, that's Allah using that child as a means to tell you, hey, you need to fix up. You haven't, you haven't moved into the next phase of your life yet. Why, you know, if you're, if you're behaving like this as a, as a father and somebody who's responsible over your family, uh, you really need to, to check yourself. So if you don't check yourself first, then definitely, you know, either your wife or your kids will. Uh, so nobody wants that. Everyone should hold themselves to account before anybody yes. else does and before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does. Um, Etisham, Jazakallah khair for your time, man. Uh, right, yeah. we've, we've hit our time limit. And to be honest, we could go on for ages about various different topics. So I'll probably have to bring you on another point. Maybe we will let, relax for now and <laughs> alhamdulillah, next baby is, uh, is born, is on the way. May Allah bless that journey and make it Amen. easy for you and your wife um, and uh, put barakah in your household. Jazakallah khair for joining me. I appreciate it. No, I appreciate it. And I uh, just want to say, you know, amazing work that you do. Alhamdulillah, may Allah make a sadaqah jaliya for you, bring benefit, Amen. change, and reward you for all that that is changed and the goodness that is brought into the world. Ameen, ameen, ya Rabbi. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum.